So what exactly is comics? That might seem like the most obvious question in comic studies. How do you study something if you don't even know what it is? Well, it turns out the answer to that question is pretty complicated. As you've read in Understanding Comics, Scott McCloud has a pretty famous definition, and it's become really influential and quite well known even outside of people who study comics. What I'm going to do today is start with McCloud's definition, but actually also give you a couple of other competing definitions of comics. We'll see that something that seems really easy and obvious is actually a lot more complicated than it looks. Now what I'm going to do for each definition, including McCloud's, is show a couple of examples of different forms of art and say whether or not they count as comics under this definition. So, as you probably remember, Scott McCloud's definition is that comics is juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence, intended to convey information and or produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. Well, let's break down this definition a little bit. So here are the examples. We'll talk more about these when we talk about comics and prehistory. So this medieval manuscript here, under Scott McCall's definition, that counts. We've got juxtaposed images. Little Sammy Sneeze by Windsor McKay, again, juxtaposed images. The bio tapestry, he counts these images as juxtaposed, even though there's not traditionally what we consider panels. Far side, even though a lot of us think of this as comics, for him, it doesn't count. It's a single image, and therefore it is a cartoon and not comics. Rudolf Topfer, his illustrations count, even though there's no word balloons or anything like that. The idea that single panel cartoons don't count really bothered another critic by the name of Robert Harvey. In an essay called How Comics Came to Be, Harvey gives this definition. It seems to me that the essential characteristic of comics, the thing that distinguishes it from other kinds of pictorial narratives, is the incorporation of verbal content. I even go so far as to say that in the best examples of the art form, words and pictures blend to achieve a meaning that neither conveys alone without the other. To McLeod, sequence is at the heart of the functioning of comics. To me, blending verbal and visual content is. So what counts for Harvey? Well, I think St. Stephen Harding's Bible would count. We've got an interesting blending of verbal content via the Bible verses and the illustrations, so the visual content. Likewise, Little Sammy Sneeze. The bio tapestry is a little bit more complicated. There is some verbal content, but it's mostly just captions. Titles over a few spots. I'm not sure it would count. For Robert Harvey, single panel cartoons can count. His argument is that because the joke isn't funny with just the picture or just the title, but requires them working together, they count as comics. And likewise, Rudolph Topfer would work under Harvey's definition. So, there's two definitions. Here's the third. This is David Kunzel in his book, The Early Comic Strip. Now, unlike McLeod and Harvey, who have kind of holistic definitions, Kunzel has a checklist. He says, one, there must be a sequence of separate images. Two, there must be a preponderance of image over text. Three, the medium in which the strip appears and for which it was originally intended must be reproductive. That is, in a printed form, a mass medium. And four, the sequence must tell a story which is both moral and topical. Well, what counts for him? Well, not St. Stephen Harding's Bible. This is a one-of-a-kind work of art. It is not in a reproducible mass medium print. Sammy Sneeze? Well, it counts for most of them, but that last one, moral or topical? I'm not so sure. This one's just kind of a joke. Once again, the Bayou Tapestry doesn't count. It's a one-of-a-kind work of art. It's not in a reproducible medium. Single-panel comics don't count for him either. His number one requirement is sequence of panels. I guess that leaves Topfer, which does count for him. These stories, as we'll talk about in a few lectures from now, are topical, satirical, humorous stories meant to instruct children. On top of it, they're in a reproducible print medium, and they have sequence of images. Another guy who has a list, although he doesn't have bulleted numbers, is Bill Blackbeard in the Smithsonian Collection of Early Newspaper Comics. In the Smithsonian Collection of Newspaper Comics. 
Comics is a serially published, episodic, open-ended dramatic narrative series of linked anecdotes about recurrent identified characters told in successive drawings, regularly enclosing balloon dialogue or its equivalent, and generally minimal narrative text. So what counts for him? Well, again, St. Stephen Harding's Bible is not serially published, but Little Sammy Sneeze is, and we've got word balloons and dialogue and recurring characters, so he counts where he didn't count for Kunzel, or at least was questionable. Bayou Tapestry doesn't count, once again, not reproducible. The question of sequence is a little bit more up for grabs in Blackbeard, especially because people like Gary Larson do occasionally use recurring characters. Finally, Topfer, he doesn't count. Lack of word balloons really bothers Blackbeard. For him, this is a pre-comics thing, and comics don't really become comics until we start to use word balloons and not just illustrations with captions. The difference with the far side is that those are meant to be dialogue, whereas with Topfer, those are descriptive captions of what's happening. So why does it matter? I mean, on the one hand, it seems really obvious that you should have a definition for the thing that you're studying. On the other hand, some of these definitions seem to be really splitting hairs. Well, there's a couple of reasons that I wanted to talk to you about definitions of comics. One was to show you that even though Scott McCloud's definition is really influential and important, it's by far not the only definition of comics. And a lot of people actively disagree with him. The other one was to have you think a little bit about how people go about defining comics. It turns out we tend to think that definitions, especially in the dictionary, are the be-all, end-all truth of how things mean and what things are. But the people who define things, they have their reasons. All of these guys who I've just quoted, their definitions of comics come as much from what they want comics to be as what they think comics are. There's a kind of political or purposeful aspect to their act of defining. So in part, it's to help you understand how people think about comics, and in part, it's to also get you to think about how we define works of art, mediums, things that are really difficult to pin down. Speaking of art, next time we'll look at visual rhetoric, or how images make meaning.